How's it going out there? It's September 23rd. I'm Frank Curzio, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, where I break down the headlines and uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. So I have a great interview set up for you today. Someone I respect, someone that's incredibly smart, someone that always shares great ideas with the audience, and someone who's a good friend. That's Frank Holmes, CEO, Chief Investment Officer of U.S. Global Investors. Also, interim CEO, executive chairman of Hive Blockchain, so a person who has exposure to both cryptos and gold, which you usually don't hear often. Frank, what's going on? How's everything, buddy? It's great to be with you, Frank. It's the Frank and Frank team. The Frank and Frank team. You know, I'm going to go right into it. Usually I give you a chance to say, uh, you know, how could people reach out to you? But you have your Frank blog, and I just saw it. You have a, a live feature, Frank Blog Live. I mean, what's that about? It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's uh, the market department about uh, communicating with more demand for our hearing what we're seeing and doing. And I've been traveling more now, Frank. Wheels up for the Jets ETF. Uh, but I've been uh, flew to Sweden recently. I've uh, been in New York. Uh, so that if people want to know about where you're traveling, what you're, what you're seeing and doing. And in addition to our different funds um, that are basically you know covering the world. No, that's great stuff. I know travel has opened up, right? I've been traveling too myself, which it's it's nice to see, right? It's 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 pretty cool. And and you're like me, right? Those face to face meetings are so important than, than Zoom calls and, and stuff. And like it's that. cleaner, Frank. The jets are much cleaner. You would know. You should explain it to everybody. I mean, I know pilots out there listen to this. They tell me. I mean, how how you know the air gets filtered. People are always worried. I mean, listen, terminals might be different or whatever. You're in crowds even afterwards. I don't know. In cabs or, or you know Ubers, you have to wear masks and stuff. But the airplanes itself are one of the safest places, right? You could be. Yes. And we have a new pandemic. It's for the anti-vaccinated, the unvaccinated <laughs> pandemic. Uh, the Delta force is hitting them hard. And uh, it's interesting in Texas, 99% of those that were vaccinated came down uh, with, with the Delta variant, survived, lived, and it was a bad cold. Uh, only those that passed away had some other serious uh, uh, ailment. So I, I think it's interesting. Uh, the Jets has really, uh, it, it's turned and it's very positive. Canada's finally opened up. Uh, and big news this week was Biden uh, all of a sudden stopped Europeans uh, that couldn't fly here directly. They had to go through Mexico for two weeks or Canada for two weeks to get into America. And, and that was really hurting cross trade. So that's opened up this week. So I think you're going to see packed airplanes flying there, which I experienced two weeks ago. And coming back was only half full. I think you're going to be totally full today. Yeah. And you would know Jets ETF, largest airline ETF. But I do want to get to, let's start with gold. We'll get to gold and the gold. only one. Don't forget, the only, the only one, the yes. And, and that's why you're the largest. But it is, I mean, with the assets yeah. in there right now, it's grown incredibly since, you know, I remember probably when you launched the thing, right? Uh, just under uh, three and a half billion. Uh, wow. You know, we still have these positive flows on, on the down days. The big headwind was the negative narrative on the Delta variant. And mm -hmm. two was the rising price of oil. So what you're seeing is that those um, airlines like American Airlines do not hedge. So there's a bigger short position put on American and hedgies are buying jets and shorting American Airlines. So you see that. And if oil starts to fall, they'll unwind that trade. Uh, and, and I think that that's what we're seeing a lot of flows in. Yeah, I know you pay attention to flows, analytics and things like that. But uh, three and a half, good for you. Uh, remember the little guys. You still got to come on the podcast and do this with me. But I'm not how big you get, Frank. So, uh, But I'm well, glad that- uh, so Frank, they're so key. You know what? You're one of the few um, writers and, and commentators that really captured the significance 18 months ago of them coming into and, and lighting up price discovery, which the markets were long needed. Yes. And and that is just the, always a negative narrative. But we've shown recently that there are almost 40,000 Robin Hoods, Robin Hooders bought Jets ETF between 12 and $14, and then it doubled. So they were quite, quite accurate in the forecast, whereas Buffett capitulated right at the bottom. Okay, let's talk about that. All right, I was going to talk about gold and get into it. Let's talk about so someone that, that's into heavily data analytics, right, which I love. And I always learn when, when, you know, some of the stuff that, that you say, it, you know, in volatility and tracking deviations and stuff. We're seeing this more and more where 
You're a seasoned investor. I'm a seasoned investor. We get it right more than we're wrong. We won't be doing what we're doing. But we're seeing a lot of amateur investors come into this market and buy Robinhood right off the start, which I was really pissed off at because it was kind of like they were just dumping onto them, right? You have the insiders selling. They did direct listing. They didn't go through investment banks. So they were able to, to sell out a little quicker in terms of, of the lockup period. But then I was happy that this thing really took off for them. But even the AMCs, we're seeing them get in early on a lot of things. And even, you know, you see Warren Buffett capitulating at the bottom, yet a lot of these young kids buying airlines. I mean, is there something to be said with that, especially from someone data analytics where you want to look at the data, you want to make sure you're not going to make mistakes, but that that's an interesting trend, right? I mean, how you never thought that would happen, right? Usually these are the people that are getting killed. It, it, yet they it's seem like it's transformative. It's transformative. Mm -hmm. It's profound uh, that these, you know, young people that a lot of them Series 7, I was stuck at home, all of a sudden took their knowledge and started going on YouTube and they got more information from searching uh, Google and found out that after every global crisis, uh, the airlines fall 70% and the following year they ri rise 80 to 120%. Not one major wirehouse was telling you this about the airlines in March to June of 2020, not one. Everything was bad, everything was negative. There was no idea that hope was at the end of the tunnel. It was always another train coming at you. But these analysts went and did their own research. And a lot of them listen to you and podcasts such as yourself and YouTube. And that's where they're going out and getting their knowledge and insight. And then they go and confirm on Google. So it's like me watching Netflix, watching the Medici's, and I quickly go to Google to find out is this accurate information and trying to triangulate that information because it's entertaining to watch it, history uh, of the banking empire of the Medici's. But then a lot of the material in that uh, series was accurate. So that's what they do today. They triangulate, they ignore Wall Street. And I, I mean, just to see that trend to me is really incredible where I think the ESG names, yeah, they got wrong. They went a little crazy on those, but just to see what's holding up, right? The AMCs, uh, you know, and a lot of these meme stocks are, are not just, hey, you know, we, we made money on options and things like that. And even Bitcoin's another good example, right? And maybe we'll go there and we'll, we'll talk about gold in a minute. But you know, with Hive Technologies, you, you, Hive Blockchain, you, you've been in this trend for a while. Uh, we saw recent news come out with the SEC, right? And chairman saying, look, a lot of these, we might regulate the exchanges. They need a lot of these things trading in securities, which I kind of agree with. How does that impact maybe your company? If it does, is it strength there? Because I would say Ethereum and, and Bitcoin, no matter what, are, are not securities. At least, you know, they're going to be deemed not securities. But there's a lot of things on there in those altcoins that are. But we're seeing like, you know, crypto, especially Bitcoin, go all over the place. Uh, what are your thoughts on what's going on right now? Because I just wish that they would just say yes or no and regulate the freaking thing. But when you're on the sidelines, it's hard for institutional money to come in. It's hard for people to say, OK, what's next? And you're going back and forth. It, it, it's it's kind of frustrating. Let's just get the rules, right? Let's see what, what the playing field's all about. This way, investors could, could make their own decisions and, and throw money into this, right? Well, I think there's some interesting debates. You know, when, when you go to the socialist politician, the, the, the biased mindset is very centralized. Socialism is about centralizing and controlling uh, society, uh, money in particular. And when you get Congress uh, people and you get senators that are of this leaning, they're attacking Ginsler as the SEC, who's trying to be balanced. This is a gentleman that that uh, was a SCS or CFTC. Then he taught uh, blockchain at MIT, and now he's the head of the SEC. He sees this big trend at a, at a macro level. But we have the G7 countries have basically formed a finance minister's cartel central bankers cartel, and Janet Yellen is leading it. You saw the first big move was a 15% flat tax between the G7 countries. Unheard of. That takes away innovation and competition. Uh, and so now you're seeing a, a synchronized, organized attack on crypto as much as they've subdued gold. And I think the big rational part of that equation is Ginsler wants to turn around and regulate bad characters in the business, but believes that blockchain is an incredible piece of technology, uh, whereas the socialist mindset is fighting. So I think you're going to have to deal with that volatility. I think that uh, every time PayPal comes out with some new addition of how they're using it, I think this is quite a big, big event today. Crypto starts off negative this morning, but Robinhood comes out with a, with new uh, wallets, et cetera, for crypto and sentiment 
all of a sudden springs into the equation and the crypto stocks like Hive jump 10%. Uh, we see uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum all of a sudden have a, a short price a surge. So I, I think that we're, we're in a secular bull market. Uh, the G7 countries are afraid um, of, of losing control because they want to control all private assets, Frank. It's just recognizing cash. If they get eliminate cash and come with their own digital money, they'd be the happiest because they could track every penny you make. Um, they don't like gold or silver. And definitely Bitcoin is one of those other private assets that you that it's the bearer securities. Remember, we used to have bearer bonds until 1982 when they basically said all bearer bonds have to be uh, filed and registered. So I think you're you're in a big wrestle globally with the with this movement at crypto, but it's not going away. And and I think you just have to learn to live with that volatility. No, I hear you. I love the fact that you're doing this interview and how busy you are because your phones, you hear the bings on your computer. I mean, I'm glad you take the time to do this. I know how busy you are. It's awesome. I'm like, all right. I've got a big webcast after this with um, uh, 600 RIAs on wow. on Jet's uh, industry. So always mm -hmm. in motion. So so let, let's talk about Hive and where where you originally started from, where it is now. And let's bring everybody in here. Pretend that, you know, people are just learning about crypto mining. You know, they think Bitcoin only, your Ethereum, where you mine for this, uh, you know, Ethereum 2.0, how that's going to impact. But you guys have been ahead of the trend. It's, it's it's something that you need very cheap electricity for in order to, to you know, it's not the easiest thing to scale because it co comes with more costs. You got to buy more machines and everything. And then the machines, are, you know, ant miners are very expensive. Talk about the whole thing because it seems like you know, it, you're well ahead of the trends in terms of getting the right inventory, having the cheap electricity, and you could even go into the ESG part, which is really, really huge, right? It is very big. Um, what I'm thrilled about is that when we launched a uh, high blockchain and being a, a early investor and, uh, and that was very significant and sort of mapping out the strategy that we would have an ESG strategy from the beginning and we would have um, green and clean coins. And now that's become very important because if you have to go buy carbon credits, that adds between five and seven thousand dollars the cost to mining a Bitcoin. So we don't have that headwind. Uh, but we all got tagged when Elon Musk was negative on the industry um, five months ago. Uh, and, I, and I became involved with the mining community of trying to educate and inform the mining. Crypto mining does not use as much electricity as alleged. One. Two, the biggest polluters using coal were the Chinese. They threw, they stopped all of that. Once again, a socialized government, a communist government, uh, wants to have their own digital money and doesn't want any competition. Uh, now they've moved over to Kazakhstan, which predominantly uses coal. So I think that Hive, which was the very first public company to go and mine crypto, not have an AML concern, uh, only green energy. So we're in Sweden, we're in Iceland, that's geothermal, hydroelectricity in Sweden. And we expanded in the past year in Canada. And we're building a big campus in New Brunswick, right on the border of Maine in Grand Falls. Uh, and it's going from 30 megawatts to 50 megawatts to 80 megawatts. And I think when we're all finished, it'll be 100 megawatts of green and clean energy. And we're in Quebec. So we're, we're positioned. We mine Ethereum and we mine Bitcoin and we hold as much as possible. Uh, we can on our balance sheet. And that's really helped this Bitcoin and Ethereum rally every time our balance sheet explodes uh, in, in overall liquid liquidity. You know, it, it's – I wanted to ask you brought up China, right? Because it's amazing when I see the ESG angle, which regardless if you agree with it, you have to go that way, right? Every company, every presentation, as you know, you cover a lot of companies. They they all have, you know, a dedicated part of their presentation for this. You have to have it now. It's almost being forced whether you believe it or not. Uh, and it is that perception out there, like you mentioned, where, where it comes to, to crypto mining is, is the equivalent of, you know, the operation of a large coal mine, right? <laughs> as crazy as it is, but, but – you mentioned China. Now that China said, okay, no more mining and pretty much banned it, how does that reflect for your company? Because I would think that's more demand. Uh, they have to find places they can do this. They need cheap electricity, which is very, very, very difficult to find. Uh, how does that benefit you? Does it benefit you in any way? And uh, talk about that trend because uh, you know I would think eliminating, eliminating people out of this market would be better for you guys, wouldn't it? Well, it surprised me some of the hedge funds that are investing 
in some of these crypto projects that are in Kazakhstan. Um, uh, and, and they've not really done their due diligence, so they really don't compare about ESG. But ESG is big and it's growing. Uh, and it's very important to get, for Hive to get listed in Asia. Um, ESG strategy has been very important for us to, when we've explored that opportunity. And the same thing in Europe. And it's going to only grow here in, in North America. I think Canada is a percentage of the capital markets has a higher sort of ESG footprint. Uh, it's a much smaller market than the U.S., but the U.S. is growing that way. And and young millennials, um, they're, they're basically demanding that you have an ESG strategy. And I'm happy that we do. Um, and we have uh, uh, many things that sort of show that. Our technology is very advanced in Sweden. We, we tune down at peak energy periods for the community. We can go from 20 megawatts to one in 15 seconds uh, when everyone's popping their toasters and hair dryers on in the morning. And then at dinner in the evening, once again, go down and go right back up much faster than any utility company could do. So uh, from that end, we do have a great sustainable approach and we've been invited into other communities that want to use what we're doing, our concepts. Uh, and, and we're working on education of kids of how to run data centers. Uh, I believe this NVIDIA ac uh, acquisition of assets to upgrade all of our uh, Ethereum mining facilities uh, is a phenomenal strategy for us because the cloud is going to become very important in many ways, more than one. And data centers are going to grow uh, with the growth in AI needs. And the needs are growing at an exponential rate. So with that, our, these NVIDIA chips allow us to pivot, Frank. So let me give you an idea. Our, our 580 AMD chips, uh, they make $2 a day. And... Uh, and if you were doing selling that to AI, they needed that for that research, it's $2 an hour you charge. If you're at Amazon, they have to pay 4 to $6 an hour. So our strategy is to say that these new chips we've upgraded with will allow us to be very competitive in mining Ethereum and give us the ability to participate in the big secular move with the cloud and GPU needed chips for data mining. I love that. I love that. So you talk about things that you can control, right? So, so your costs, the electricity prices, very, very important, making sure you have the right inventory, the right chips. Let's talk about things that you might not be able to control and how do you view that? Because I know you always you, know, you talk about risk management and use data analytics, but there's no data that can come out to tell you what the government's going to do. And the SEC has come out and, and you know, against Coinbase, I mentioned earlier, but more importantly, you have Ray Dalio, who's a pretty smart guy. I actually like him. Uh, one of the richest people on earth, investors, saying that he doesn't think big, he, if Bitcoin gets much bigger, that the government could come after it. it. Could that, in your opinion, do you think that's something that could happen? I mean, we're talking about Bitcoin, new technology, something that infringes on the biggest companies and banks on our banking system in the world, which is lobby dollars, which is a lot of power that people hate giving up. Do you think it's possible that that could actually happen? Well, they definitely could try, um, but I think what's really significant is how big and global the ecosystem is. Uh, it, it's like the recent conferences uh, when I was in Miami, 13,000 people spending $1,500 a person to go to a conference. Frank, you and I participated in speaking at conferences. No one gets charged that amount, and it was sold out. There were scalpers. So you have to realize you go to New Zealand as a conference. They're in South Africa. They're, they're everywhere in the world. Uh, there's 13,000 nodes around the world in the decentralized mechanism of, um, of, my, of looking at, e, at Bitcoin. When it comes to Ethereum, we're talking about 30,000 data scientists around the world that are participating in that uh, growth of Ethereum. So I, I don't think they can turn around and try to stop it, but it'll just spring back bigger than ever. And they are right now. The G7 countries are doing everything to dampen, to slow down its adoption by, by the masses. And, and it's really hard for them to turn around and stop it totally because it's global and it's decentralized. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so let, let's change tunes here and, and go to gold, right? So you have your gold, gold e ETF, and we look at Evergrande. Evergrande was a story this week on Monday. I'm looking at the markets right now, and it seems like everything's perfectly fine. We just recuperated most of those losses. Uh, we know the real estate. We see the damage. Uh 
you know, we see what's going on with the amount of spending in governments, how the Fed's going to be stuck where who knows what they're going to do because we're going to see massive inflation because supply shortages lasting. Now we're seeing years. Some of the biggest CEOs saying that this isn't like a, a couple quarters, which is going to lead to higher prices of raw materials and everything. It almost seems like the absolute perfect environment for gold. It can't get better than this. Why isn't gold going higher? It's a great question. Uh, I, I think that uh, there is a, a mechanism uh, in, in using the futures market. If you want to go and trade the futures market for uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, it's 100% cash. You can't get any leverage. But gold and silver are highly leveraged, so it doesn't take much capital to suppress it. Uh, and and there have been many lawsuits. They've been found guilty, just like they went after traders that work for the big money center banks uh, for manipulating LIBOR. They were charged and found guilty for manipulating gold prices. So I, I think that uh, there's some sub, some form of suppression that's taking place. Uh, and it's even more significant when the G7 have formed this sort of cartel of how they're functioning. So they So I believe they can get away with their MMT. If, if uh, all the country's currencies say on a relative basis, gold doesn't take off, uh, then they can continue with their MMT, modern monetary theory concept of, of using monetary printing to drive the economy. So, I mean, based on that thesis, should we own gold? I mean, because it's it, something has to change, right? I mean, it, it makes sense yes. to own it. Not only that, I'm not even just talking about the gold price, the equities, when you look at their production costs have gone down significantly, right? They're under $1,000 for the majors, most of them. You're seeing, even at, at current price, their margins have been greater. A lot of them have dividends now, the majors. When you look from a growth perspective in terms of where they're trading on a piece of so price to earnings growth, it's one of the best sectors you could find based on their growth and how cheap these companies are to buy. But like you said, if that continues and there is manipulation in this market and we're not seeing gold go up in a market where it's almost, I don't know if we can get any better for this for gold, you know, you know, what do you say to that? What, yeah, what do we do? I think that you're right, Frank, that it's the highest percentage of the universe of stocks we follow. It's about 100 that have free cash flow. Um, several of uh, the big caps are throwing off $100 million of free cash flow. Mm -hmm. I think another factor that makes them uh, undervalued is, is that they not being able to capture the price discovery by the millennials. And, and I spoke recently at the Denver Gold Forum. Uh, it was to all the CEOs and CFOs of the industry and analysts. And, and I basically said that if you've got free cash flow, you should hold your gold because it's too cheap to sell. And, and, and that is something that the crypto mining companies, that they get a different valuation if they hold all their coins. And, uh, and, and so you're seeing, well, that concept, I think only Grand Columbia is the only company that started holding back on some of their gold, believing it will trade higher. Uh, but we've got to get Barrick and, and, uh, uh, in particular, Newmont, uh, to turn around and do another thing was not only hold some of their gold, but put blockchain, put gold wherever they mine on the blockchain so they can say there's no blood gold like blood diamonds that they're so therefore that fits into an ESG strategy because gold mining companies have done a phenomenal job uh, with communities around the world by far leaders in it mm -hmm. uh, before ESG they were already doing what's was required in ESG but I think they have to sort of change some of that form not just the substance and that is uh, come out with this blockchain that they're using blockchain to monitor where all their equipment is, where all their gold is produced from, and start holding their gold when they have free cash flow. And I think these stocks could go through a re-rating. And, and we, I mean, we've seen that it, it could take long and expand. I'm saying the conditions are right. The conditions are really right for the last four or five years for uranium to take off. And finally, we saw price discovery, which, you know, was helped from a vehicle through Sprott. But, I mean, price go immediately from 29 to 50, where, yeah, that's the cost for at least Camago to, to actually mine and, and, and break even. You know, you see oil fall below that price. You see at least supply come off the market. But at these prices, it almost encourages, you know, the gold producers to continue to produce because their costs are so low. It's just, is there a supply demand imbalance where, where we saw with uranium where a lot of people, very, very smarter than me, brilliant people thought that, you know, uranium should have took off two, three, four years ago. Now we see it all at the same time and everybody's rushing in. Could, you think we could see something like that with gold with... Uh, because to, to be this depressed in this kind of uh, market, it just seems like we need a little bit of push I, I, now. I agree with you. And I do think that the big infrastructure spend is going to be very bullish for silver. Um, uh, silver is still on a relative basis holding up, I think, quite well. 
uh, and and I think the silver can easily go to fifty dollars an ounce. Uh, and because of this, the whole solar needs as 20% of the demand for silver. So silver is not only money and it's inexpensive to buy coins and store. Uh, it has a much bigger industrial demand behind it. Uh, as for gold, uh, we're in that peak supply period. So I think you're going to see um, uh, acquisitions uh, probably have to take off to for companies to maintain their growth rates unless they can find from the existing deposits more gold. No, that's cool. That, that, that makes sense. So, uh, all right, we just finish it up here. I like to get ideas, but I'm going to get ideas right here, right from your blog, because this surprised me. Why we're bullish on Russia and Eastern Europe right now? Again, this is uh, U.S. Global Investors. Frank, talk your blog. Uh, really, Russia, I mean, that's uh, from left field, right? Not too many people are saying, hey, Russia is great. And I read this article, and you make a really, really good case. It's not just like, hey, Russia could do this. I mean, there was a lot of great, great talking points. Uh, you know, Why don't you tell us why, why do you like Russia so much? Well, they have a big surplus when it comes from exporting energy uh, and, and they have real interest rates, real positive interest rates, whereas most of the rest of the companies have negative real interest rates. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, it, it's inc very impressive when you take a look at uh, their surplus. So Canada was locked down much more severe than the U.S. and they could do that because they're running a surplus by exporting oil. Uh, and, and companies that that have an that are inverted to that need tourism. They need uh, other forms of capital coming in. Uh, Russia is an interesting spot, but it still you know gets a negative psychology. Uh, Putin doesn't help with all his negative talk, but it's actually quite quiet now uh, that Trump is not in power. If you notice that um, one day he's blamed for being partners with, with Putin, the next day he's blamed for being an enemy of Putin. Uh, all that drama, that narrative is gone. Uh, and, and oil and gas where they are is just making Russia buckets of money. No, that's cool. And, and last thing here, which I love, is uh, <laughs> the Frank Talk Live. I love the headset, the, the microphone. Again, we, we broadcast this on YouTube as well. We tape all of our uh, podcasts now and videotape them. Uh, so this is Frank Talk Live. Can I really go on there and ask you a question? I mean, because uh, that looks – if I do, I'm going to ask you a simple question is – a San Antonio Spurs, which you're a season ticket holder. I mean, what are they doing? They're ranked 21st in the power ranking last year, which I know is really hard to take for you guys because it's like the Patriots and these guys always make the playoffs and are always great. But what are they doing going forward? Uh, let's see how these rookies <laughs> gel. You know, it's uh, they have so much young talent. And um, and let's see, it's like buying a portfolio of uh, – uh, junior stocks uh, and uh, seeing if, if you've got enough good winners in there. We'll see. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Well, guys, if you want to take but, but management, but management, Frank has got a great track record of picking particular international talent. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they do. I can go. Uh, wow. A ton. Ginobili. Right? Ginobili is amazing. Ginobili. Tony Ginobili's Parker. I Tony Parker. Tony Parker doesn't seem like, 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 I don't know. He seems like, like an American to me though, right? <laughs> He's French, but what a great, great point guard. It's so amazing with championships. But yeah, you guys had a lot of fun there for a while. Frank, well, thank you so much for coming on. If people want any more information, go to US Global Investors. Frank, talk live. Frank, he does a lot thank of information. You, Love having you on. Really appreciate it. And uh, I know you join us again soon. Okay, buddy? Take care, my friend. It's all right, guys. So that's it for me. Uh, any questions, comments, frankcurzyresearch.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. Love you guys. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you guys next week. Take care.